and I don't know how you get it back out. Judge, I think now we could agree, perhaps, not to send it back because it's redundant, with the exception of the one photograph. And oh, by the way, the one photograph. I don't know what the problem with the one photograph is, but it's different in the two discs. And this this points out to me the small problem of doing these things on discs and you know the advent of all this high tech stuff and something comes up during the course of things when you've already got the disc in evidence and everything's in and then you run into a little bit of a issue that's why sometimes old school works just as well where you've got your hard copy photographs and they yeah. come in one by one. It's a little more tedious, I understand, but anyway, I digress. Um, Judge, I was just, again, I was just suggesting, I don't want to agree that some evidence doesn't go back in case the jury asks about it. I think if there's just an explanation, what it was is they just moved the red box over what they thought was over the casing and moved it and then flipped it. I think the witness can testify that's why it's revised. They had to move the box to make it a little bit more friendly. They, they thought okay. they had it over a casing, but it was on something. Well, did you object to that? Did I object to the, that? The photograph that's been changed up, did it get changed because of an objection that you had? No, Your Honor. The, the state actually found that their box was on something wrong. It wasn't on the actual casing itself, so they had to move their little highlight box to where it showed where it was. Oh. And then this court just had to rotate the little small box to show where it is. So, again. Okay. Well, then maybe that's the way we'll do it. We, we, um, here's the other problem. Already in evidence, what, what, whatever number photograph this is. 105. Okay. Already in evidence is photograph number 105. Yes. Now, photograph 105 is going to be different. So... Yes. It has to be numbered something else. Can we just number it 105A on that disc? Can I pull it sure. back up and number it 105A? And then I still or, wouldn't see a need to put two discs in. It's making a small modification. I, I don't know. I know you want to It's in evidence. evidence but Judge, yeah, I but I think, can the parties agree <coughs> to, to change an exhibit in evidence? For example, if Mr. Rowland had left something off and we agreed that he could add an arrow to his photo. I think you can agree to change something that's in evidence as long as all the parties agree. I didn't it, realize it would cause this much of an issue, Judge. Well, I, 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 I hope it doesn't, but, and again, I, I don't want to be over technical about it. But if yes, if y'all want to agree, but I just don't know how. I've never had an occasion where we have admitted something into evidence and then decided we're going to take it out and replace it with something else. I mean, it seems logical. I've just never done it before. Judge, instead of, again, just, again, not from the court or the state, another option to make it real easy, instead of submitting another disc of 1 through 60, one photo that was changed and corrected on one disc as 150A, and then that way the jury has 1 through 160 that's already in evidence, and then the witness can explain how this well, photo was changed. Might I suggest, with your agreement, you take the exhibit that we've got, since you haven't shown 105, and you fix it on the exhibit that we already have, and we don't get another disc. Well, that's the problem with that. Once you burn a read-only file to a disc, you can't do that. I tried <laughs> it that way for a minute. There you go with this high technology <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but I want to remind you, 160 photographs past the 16 jurors would add three days to the trial. I understand. Um, no, I know, Judge. It, it's, it's I understand. I'll defer the court. Actually, we can hold off on this because that witness isn't going to see that. Uh, nobody's going to see that until we're after the morning break if you want to hold off. I would suggest that. then on the second disc, you uh, call. 105. <coughs> you, and again, I'm, maybe I just overthink things. Here's the other problem you got a second disc that's coming in. It's got the same photographs on it with the same numbers. Well, maybe we've had this discussion. If this if this winds up on an appeal, the district court of appeal can figure it out. We just make 105, 105 A, 105 R, 105, whatever you all agree to call it. Everything else would be the same number. 
It's or a whatever you want to call it. Now are we going to we're not submitting another 160 photos. Are we just going to submit the one 105 as a separate photo on a second disc? That was my second option to the court. Uh, that sounds a little bit better to me. That that would just be my suggestion. I would have no objection to that. So that way they have states exhibit one composite one, I guess one from the right. 160, and then they would have. Just one photograph, a even though it's on a disc. Right. Yes, Why don't we do that? What would you like to do? I just have just the one photograph, 105. Mm -hmm. We'll call it, call it A or R, whatever you'd like. Okay. And that would be the only photograph on that disc. Perfect. I'll do it that way. Thank and you. then that disc actually would be called States Exhibit 105 R. R. I'll or A, yes. I'd say R. Yes, sir. Um, so you At a point, to too, when we get to that, uh, I'll just jump in and explain to the jurors that they may never notice it, but I'll explain to them that uh, this is a little revised from the first photograph. If they were to ever compare the two. What I'm actually going to do, if it's okay with you, is I'll pull up the original 105, show them where we put the red box on the wrong thing, show 105R immediately afterwards, and tell them they'll have both of them. That's perfect. All right. You that worked for you, Mr. Stroller? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. You asked to see anything I was going to use to display our physical evidence. Is this table permissible with the court? I had planned on putting it where you tell me to, but I'll have a display for this first witness. Okay. I was hoping to. Other than the fact that it does not match with our decor, uh, and a lot of time, effort, thought, and of course money went into our decor, yes, sir. but it's a lovely table. Thank you. It is and lovely. yes, you can use that to wheel your evidence around. Thank you. But perhaps in the future you might want to get somebody to stain it so it matches with everything. <laughs> Just in kidding. My, in my <laughs> Mr. Stroll, how about you? Yes, Your Honor, we are ready. And I know the jury's ready to go, so let's bring them on in. Good morning, folks. Welcome back. Y'all can have a seat. Uh, as I said before y'all came out, I said good morning to everybody else out there, and I said good morning for us to be here as opposed to doing anything else because it's very ugly outside, and I don't know what the rest of the day will bring, but it looks like a good day to do some, some work. So uh, welcome back, and uh, again, thank you for your time and attention. And here we are in day six, so hopefully you're well-rested and ready to... Uh, get in a full day's work. Uh, Ms. Corey, are you ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Detective Andrew Kippel. Detectra, Detective Kippel. Kippel. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, Detective. If you'll come right up here to the front for us, please. And you can raise your right hand. The clerk will administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank All right, you. detective. If you'll come around, have a seat in the witness chair. And be sure to speak loudly and directly into the microphone so everybody can hear. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Miss Corey. Yes, Your Honor. State your name for the record, sir. Andrew F. Kippel. Spell your last name. K-I-P-P-L-E. By whom are you employed? The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. How long have you been an officer with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? For 18 years. Please tell the jurors about your experience during that 18 years. Uh, my experience, I've been a patrol officer, a burglary detective, and currently I work within the crime scene unit. And throughout all those types of duties on behalf of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, have you responded to crime scenes in all of those capacities? 
Yes, I have. All right. And have you gone to special classes in addition to support your evidence technician function? Yes, I have. And your current duties with JSO, are they limited specifically to being an evidence technician? Yes, they are. What type of training did you receive specifically to process evidence and preserve it for the future? Uh, I've gone to multiple classes within my tenure as being in the crime scene unit. Uh, some of the classes I've taken have been introduction to basic crime scene processing, uh, advanced homicide investigation, uh, digital photography classes, uh, buried bodies and surface skeleton courses, and um, uh, there's been two more, I think, uh, blood stain pattern analysis and also crime scene reconstruction. And did you also do on-the-job training with those who preceded you in the unit who were considered to be senior evidence technicians? Yes, I have. And tell these jurors the difference between an evidence technician at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and a major case evidence technician. Uh, an evidence technician responds to crimes such as burglaries and, and batteries and take photographs. Uh, a major case crime scene detective will respond to homicides and process major cases within the unit. And were you assigned as a major case evidence technician on November 23rd, 2012? Yes, I was. And were you the lead major case evidence technician to respond to the gate gas station located at the intersection of Bay Meadows Road and Southside Boulevard? Yes, I was. Is that in Jacksonville, Duval County, Florida? Yes. Sir, is it the practice of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for each officer to fully document the details of each case as that case is handled? Yes, it is. Are notes made as part of the normal course of your business? Yes. And are those notes then incorporated into an official report that is then kept by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Uh, my notes, I don't keep my notes. I just, my notes get transferred onto my report and then the notes, my notes gets destroyed. Right. And that's pursuant to law that allows you to do that? Yes. Okay. And then is that report kept along with every other report pertaining to a specific case? Yes, it is. Tell the jurors how you all track a specific case. In other words, how do you and the homicide detectives make sure you keep all of the reports with one case? Uh, our reports come with a, a case report number. We call it a CCR number. And that one CCR number, all the reports related to that case will be correlated with that same number. And if another evidence technician aids you in your investigation and documentation of evidence, do they then either document it themselves under that CCR number, or do they tell you what they've done so that you then document it in your report? Correct. Thank you. And would it aid you in your testimony to be able to refer to those reports if you need to today? Yes, it would. All right. What date, what was the date and time of you being dispatched to the gate gas station on November 23rd, 2012? I was dispatched on November 23rd, 2012 at 9 p.m. And who was on scene when you arrived? Uh, when I arrived on scene, there was uh, multiple officers were on scene. Uh, there were some other evidence technicians and also homicide detectives. Can you just kind of explain to the jury how a homicide scene is locked down? In other words, as you drive up, tell them what you see. Are there patrol cars at the perimeter? Are there lights flashing to warn people not to come in? Give this jury a general idea. Uh, when I arrived upon this scene, the parking lot and all the entrances within to the business were secured by police cars blocking off entranceways and also crime scene tape that was surrounding the entire perimeter. Okay. And did you speak with homicide detectives prior to beginning your documentation of the crime scene? Yes, I did. And for what purpose do you speak with the detectives before you begin your work? Uh, I speak with them just to get an overall view of what the scene is, what they've already learned, and what I'm going to be needing to process. Did you have assistance from other major case evidence technicians at the scene? Yes, I did. Is there almost always follow-up work that has to be done in a homicide case? Yes. And then do other major case evidence technicians help on the succeeding days after the original scene is processed? Yes, they do. Okay. Do those evidence technicians also follow with the same CCR number pertaining to this case? Yes, they do. When, you, when there are gunshots fired in an open area, such as a parking lot like the gate gas station, is there any way possible 
to avoid the movement of projectiles, shell casings, or clothing, or any other types of physical evidence before police can get there and lock that scene down? No, there is not. Okay. So in your capacity as a major case evidence technician, do you ever make an attempt to move items back to their original position? When I arrive and I see the evidence, I leave it exactly where it was discovered, where I find it. Okay. And then um, do you depend on witnesses who may or may not know about that to determine its original position? Yes. Okay. So you photograph it as you find it? Correct. All right. Your Honor, I have photographs to show to this detective, if I may. All right. Detective Kippel, let me start with State's Exhibit 4. Whoops. I'm a little quick on this thing. Give me one second. All right, State's Exhibit 4. What I want you to do is give a very, the jurors have seen some of these. I want you to give a very brief explanation um, as to your vantage and why you took these photos. And, and it can be just a sentence or two. And um, I'm only going to refer, these are all in evidence, so I'll just say State's 4 and ask you to explain to the jury, please. On this photo? Uh, th this photograph is depicting the front of the gate gas station, and it's showing a white pickup truck and a red Durango in the parking lot. All right, sir. Tell the jurors about the lighting with this photo and then how it would apply to the other photos. Uh, well, the lighting on this one, the gate gas station is, is well lit uh, and I'm taking photographs. Uh, for my distance being far away with the flash I was using, it's a little bit darker uh, and the closer I would get, the brighter the flash would be, so the brighter the photographs will be. All right. State's Exhibit 5. Uh, this is another perimeter shot, an overview. It's a different angle, and it's basically more in front of the gate gas station itself. States Exhibit 6. Uh, we're moving a little bit closer, and this photograph is basically depicting uh, there's yellow numbered placards within the parking spots. So you photograph the scene before you start assigning a number to each piece of evidence. Is that correct? Well, on this particular one, I've already placed the placards down and it's, the numbers indicate where the evidence is. Right, but in the prior photograph, are those yellow placards in there? Yes, they are. Okay, I need better glasses. So, states number seven then is the same, is that ex right, with the yellow placards? Yes, it is. Okay. States number eight, sir, is that a close-up of the tag belonging to that red Dodge Durango? Yes, it is. And tell the jurors about the condition of the doors on that red Dodge Durango when you arrived and photographed it. Were they in that position? Yeah, when I arrived, I noticed that all four doors of the Durango were open. From the time you arrived on scene until the time you took these photographs, did you allow anyone to go into this red Durango, that Chevrolet, or into any other vehicle that was contained within the crime scene tape? No, I did not. States number nine in evidence. This is another photograph, uh, a closer photograph of the rear of the Dodge Durango. All right. States number 10. Uh, this photograph is focusing on the placards in the parking spot. Okay. States number 11. Uh, this is a different angle showing the perspective of the uh, placards next to the white truck. And did you take close-up photographs of each yellow placard to denote items of evidence for this case? Yes, I did. All right, let me show you then State's Exhibit 12. Tell the jurors what that is. Uh, this is a close-up photograph of placard number one, and beneath it is going to be a shell casing. Okay, and can you tell the jurors what you mean by a shell casing? Uh, a shell casing is the part of the bullet when you shoot it. It's extracted from the gun itself. The projectile comes out of the casing itself, and what remains on the ground here is the casing of the bullet itself. And from your experience as both a law enforcement officer trained to fire weapons and your experience as an evidence technician, would you expect to find shell casings at a scene where a revolver was used? No, I would not. Would you expect to find them when a semi-automatic pistol is used? Yes, I would. And so after you photograph this, do you leave it in its place until you're ready to package it and preserve it for evidence? Yes. Okay. Let's take you to States 13 and explain that to the jurors. Uh, it's placard number two, and it's showing another casing beneath it. Okay. States Exhibit 14, please. What does that show? Uh, 
this is showing an overall perspective view of the placards within the parking spaces. And is this as you look towards the store or away from the store? It's towards the store. Okay. And then States Exhibit 15, if you could give the jurors the perspective on that. Uh, this photograph is taken with my back towards the store facing towards the gas pumps itself. States Exhibit 16, would you explain that one to the jury? It's placard number three, and it's showing a casing beneath it. So literally, we're up to three shell casings at this point. Correct. Did you number specifically all of the casings in a row before you went on to other items of evidence? Yes, I did. Okay. And then States Exhibit 17. That's placard number four with the casing beneath it. So does that denote the fourth shell casing? Yes. States Exhibit 18. This is placard number five, and it's showing another casing. Okay. And States Exhibit 19. This is a closer up photograph of the casing with the placard. Okay. And so you collected a total of five shell casings from that area in the first parking spot next to the sidewalk at the gate gas station. Yes, I did. Okay. Let me show you. What has been stipulated in evidence at State Exhibit 185, Mr. Schultz? Your Honor? All right. Yes, ma'am. It asks you, sir, are these the five 9 millimeter shelf casings that you have just shown to the jury in those photographs? Yes, they are. And have they been removed for display purposes only? Yes, they have. And are your orig original packages still contained with this exhibit? Yeah, the shell casings that I packed within the packages are within this display unit. And outside of markings from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement who process these, do these appear in the same condition as when you submitted them? Yes, they do. May I publish to the jury, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have a chance to, uh, all of this will go back to the jury room with you when you uh, begin to deliberate the verdict. So you'll have a chance to review it yet again. Let me move on then, sir, to start showing you some more photographs. And let's go then to State's Exhibit 20 in evidence. Does this appear to be a different type of evidence, ballistics evidence? Yes, it does. And explain that difference to the jury. Well, what I recognize this to be is a projectile, the part that comes from the casing, and it's showing placed by placard number six. Okay. And so that's a different part of the bullet, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And did you package that separately? Yes, I did. Tell the jurors why you packaged it separately. It's a separate piece of evidence, and in case it needs to be recovered or sent off for testing, they can individually take it from the package that I placed it in. All right. And then I'm going to move on to some other photographs and come back to the actual physical evidence. Is that all right, Your Honor, if yes, I do it that way to move things along? States Exhibit 21, please tell the jurors what's depicted in this photograph. This is a photograph showing the driver's side of the Durango, and there's two more placards within that photograph. All right, sir. And let me show you then close-ups with regard to State's Exhibit 22. Does placard 7 denote more than one item of evidence? Yes, it does. And what does that denote? Well, if you look at number 7, right in front of it's a wallet, but right next to the wallet there's another little piece of metal, which is going to be a fragment from a projectile. All right, sir. And so the close-up of that, uh, can you please circle on that photograph you know how to do that with your finger? Thank you. And is that another projectile? Well, what I or fragment, I mean. show this is it's part of a projectile, but it's a fragment from it. At what point does either an evidence technician or another forensic specialist, like a medical examiner, a firearms examiner, at what point do you distinguish part of the bullet to be a fragment versus a projectile? Well, the projectile is the entire lead base and the copper jacket that's on it itself. And a fragment is just going to be a piece of the projectile. And what could cause that bullet to splinter and become fragmented? Uh, when it hits a hard object or a subject, the 
projectile then sometimes it smashes, sometimes it breaks into pieces, and there's fragments then that explode from the bullet itself, and that, that's where we find it on the ground. So would a semi-automatic firing a 9 millimeter projectile going through the metal of that red Dodge Durango have caused fragmentation of the bullet? Yes, it would. Okay. And did you package that separately as well? Yes, I did. All right. And now I've got to show you a couple of items of evidence, and let me start with statements. Judge, may I have some assistance from Mr. Guy? Yes, ma'am. With my little table that doesn't match. <laughs> and if you'll just tell us where you want it, Judge. Um, I'll let Mr. Guy <coughs> rearrange it. We joked before you came out, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Corey brought this table because she uses it in various trials and asked permission to bring another piece of furniture into the courtroom, which I said fine, and I just said it is a lovely table, it just doesn't match our, our decor. <laughs> and uh, obviously a lot of time, effort, money, we talked about that before <laughs> you all came out. So that's why she made that remark. I suggested perhaps she have somebody stain it for the next time <laughs> and uh, it probably matched in the old courthouse because the decor over there was much different but it was anyway that'll help to display these things for it, you thank you so much your honor and sure, i'm showing permission sure absolutely thank you. um do you want to do that now on this one or oh depending on how many And just, just, just so you'll know, each placard number that was in the photographs is also on these envelopes that are okay. being attached. And so, Detective Kipple, let me show you <coughs> State's Money and Six in evidence and ask you, sir, is this the projectile that was shown near those five shell casings that we've already displayed to the jury? Uh, yes, it is. And do you recognize your writing on the original packaging? Yes, I do. And does that match the photograph you've just testified to in front of this jury? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. will remind the jurors again as they're looking at this exhibit why this does not look like a full bullet that's been fired. Uh, it has struck an object, and because of the impact, the projectile itself is damaged. And was this the only projectile found in the vicinity of the five shell cases? Yes, it was. And again, sir, was there any way for you to know how that projectile ended up amongst those shell cases? Uh, well, I can tell that the vehicle was struck, that somehow it must have ricocheted from the object that it struck. fragment that you've just shown the jurors that was next to the wallet that you designated as number seven? Yes, it is. And additionally, did you put that wallet in evidence? Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you, sir. There's many different potential ways it could have. Um, it, it could have been kicked. It could, it could have fell out of the vehicle. Uh, it bounced around, rolled around. There, there's no telling. All right, sir. And again, you photographed them where you found them and packaged them and preserved them for evidence. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And Mr. Stroll, I have more photos now and then two more items. All right.
Let me take you then to the next photograph in evidence, which is states number 24. And sir, tell the jurors what this is. Uh, one photograph is of the wallet that was at the scene. And the next photograph is the same wallet. And I opened it up to take a photograph of uh, the driver's license. All right, so states 24 in evidence is a composite showing the wallet and then the wallet open. Is that correct? Yes. And is that over in the property room still? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. States 25, can you explain that photo to the jury? Uh, this is a photograph showing the front of the Durango. All right. Did you find any evidence of bullet strikes to the front of this Durango? No, I did not. And did you search in y great detail? On yes, I did. Okay. Now, was the lighting sufficient for you to look for bullet strikes so you could photograph the car as it appeared out at the gate station? Yes, it was. And were, in addition to your own lighting, were there lights from both the inside of the store as well as, I believe, the porch of the store? Yes, there was. Okay. And you saw no evidence of bullet strikes to the front of this Durango? No, I did not. States Exhibit 26, if you could give the jurors a guide on what that is. Uh, this is a photograph of the driver's area with the door open. And again, sir, to your knowledge, that door was open when you arrived. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Now, for your purposes, do you need to know who was sitting in that car or who opened that door? No, I do not. Do you leave all of those details to the homicide detectives? Yes, I do. And the items that are gathered on the floorboard, sir, did you take a glance at those items? Yes, I did. Did you see anything that you believe to be of evidentiary value for purposes of this case? No, I did not. What types of things would you be looking for as a major case evidence technician in a homicide case? Uh, I'm looking for weapons, contraband, um, items of that nature. Okay. Is there a pocket in that door? Yes, there is. Can you circle the pocket of the door? Did you closely examine the items inside the pocket of that door? Yes, I did. Did you find any weapons, sticks, cylindrical objects, metal pipes, or anything else in that pocket? No, I did not. And then, oh, well, he can't see the label. Looking in at the floorboard area, can you tell the jurors what those items are? Uh, on the floorboard is papers, and it looks like the ashtray got pulled out and cigarettes and ash spilled on the floor. All right, let's go ahead to the middle sort of console. It appears maybe cups or something. Yeah, there's two cups and a charger for a phone. Did you also look under this front seat? Yes, I did. Did you see any evidence in any of these locations of weapons? No, I did not. Okay, let's go to States Exhibit 27 and tell the jurors about this photograph. Uh, this is a photograph of the front passenger seat with the door open. Is there a pocket in that door as well? Yes, there is. And did you check to see what that brown uh, item is in the pocket? Yes, I did. And tell the jurors what that is. Uh, it's a container of some sort of a hair gel. Okay. And also, the same question, did you check under the seat here? Yes, I did. Did you ultimately check inside the glove box? Yes. Did you find anything remotely resembling a weapon in this portion of the car? No, I did not. Now, is there a little armrest in the middle? Yes, there is. Okay. And so, is there a full seat in between these two seats, in between the one, the driver and the passenger seat? Uh, the armrest folds down and it also will fold up, so if somebody needed to sit there, they okay. could have. Is there any sort of a compartment underneath that armrest? No, there is not. And underneath the armrest itself, did you find any evidence of any weapons? No, I did not. Okay. States Exhibit 28, can you tell the jurors the orientation on that photograph? This is the driver's side view of the rear passenger seat with the door open. And is that considered to be a bench seat? Yes, it is. Again, is there any sort of a compartment in the middle of that seat? Uh, no, there is not. Okay. And by compartment, I mean a storage compartment where you could lift it up and put something in and then try to make, the, make it look like a seat. Uh, I, th I think in between the two seats right here, there's going to be a little fold-down area where it's like an armrest. Okay. But nothing that would conceal a weapon, is that correct? No. Did you find any evidence of a weapon on this side of the vehicle or underneath that seat? No, I did not. About the middle of the back seat? No. And then states 29, can you explain that? Is there a pocket in that back rear passenger's door? Yes, there is. 
And, and that's the driver's side, is that correct? Correct. All right. Was there anything in that pocket that could be remotely construed as a weapon? No, there was not. State's Exhibit 30 in evidence. Please explain that photograph to the jurors. Uh, this is a photograph showing the rear door, and it's the, the locking mechanism for the door. Okay. You're familiar with child safety locks? Yes, I am. Can you circle the child safety lock on the rear passenger door? Oh, that's red on red, but Judge, can you inquire whether it can be seen? Can you see that, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Okay. okay. Otherwise, I'd have to change the color. All right, let me ask. Can you change the color since we're going to be on the red car? May we have just a second, Judge? Sure. Blue would probably show up on this photo. I can go on and ask you a question. In that photo, Here it comes. You, oh, sir. He's okay. got to circle it again. Oh, thank you so much. That's much better. Does it show whether that child safety lock is on or off? Uh, I, I actually can't tell. Okay. And would you have followed up to find out whether it was on or off or how that back door got opened? No. Again, would you have left that type of detail to the homicide detective? Yes. Thank you, sir. Let's go to States 31, and let me ask you to tell the jurors about that photograph. Uh, this is the rear passenger side of the vehicle with the door open. Okay. And did you find any weapons anywhere in that area? No, I did not. Sir, had you been told where the person who was shot, Mr. Jordan Davis, had been sitting in that car? Yes. Okay. Now, were you able to collect any of the personal clothing or items contained in the pockets of that clothing from Mr. Davis? No, I did not. Tell the jurors why you weren't able to collect those items. Uh, he wasn't present while I was at the scene. Were you aware of why he was no longer present? Yes. And tell the jurors why. Uh, he was transported to the hospital. Okay. And at that point, then, is it up to someone else when a shooting victim goes to the hospital and then the medical examiner, does the medical examiner's office then take over the packaging of the shooting, uh, the person who's been shot, do they take over the clothing? Yeah, they mean they contain custody of the clothing that the person was wearing. And then is it the custom at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for the homicide detective to then put that into evidence along with all these other items? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, was this part of the car where Jordan Davis had been sitting exactly as you photographed it immediately um, after the investigation began? Yes, it is. Okay. Did you find any evidence of any object on that seat or in the pocket of that door that resembled anything close to a weapon? Uh, no, I did not. Did you look under that seat? Yes, I did. And what was under that seat? There was nothing. Did you take a closer look later at the uh, warehouse when you got the car down there? Yes, I did. Did you find any evidence of a weapon tucked into where Jordan Davis's rear end would have been back against the back of the seat? No, I did not. And did you find, let me see if I've got a close up of the pocket. All right, States 32, that shows more of the middle area of that car? Yes. And did you find any evidence of any weapons there? No, I did not. Okay. States 33, sir, is that another view of that back seat? Yes, it is. Show the jurors the little fold-down armrest you were talking about. Uh, yeah, this is an armrest on the back seat. Did you ever fold that down? Yes, I did. Was there anything concealed in there? No, there was not. And the items on the floor, if you can just quickly tell the jurors what those are. Uh, they were cups. Okay. And then the, there appeared to be just some debris on the seat. Tell the jurors what that debris is. Uh, that debris is small broken pieces of the window, the glass from the windows. And will your warehouse picture show that better later? To yes, explain? it will. Okay. States exhibit... 34 in evidence. Can you tell the jurors what that appears to be? Uh, this is a view of the Durango, on the front of the Durango, on the passenger side. All right. And again, sir, this picture does not purport to have the Durango in the position it was in when the shooter fired.
fired at it. Is that correct? Uh, it was explained to me that it was parked in a different parking spot at the time. States Exhibit 35, can you tell the jurors, and are we still at the gate gas station at this point? Yes, we are. Okay, and tell the jurors the purpose of this picture. Uh, I'm just photographing the passenger door and the bullet strikes that are on the door. How many bullet strikes were on the front passenger seat door? There were three. Okay. Did you eventually number these bullets, bullet strikes, for purposes of documentation in this case? Yes, I did. Does your numbering of these bullet strikes in any way represent the order in which you or anyone else believes the shots were fired? No, they do not. How did you decide, bless you, how did you decide which way to number those shots? In chronological order. From which end to which end? Uh, I started at the rear of the vehicle and numbered that one with one and then worked all the way to the front. Okay, so you numbered these three bullets towards the end of the numbering. Correct. But that doesn't mean those were the last shots fired. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. You, are you going to render any opinion about the order in which the shots were fired? Uh, if I'm asked. Okay. <laughs> then we'll wait till the warehouse pictures. Let me, uh, States 35, can you circle the first of those three bullet strikes? The second bullet strike? And the third bullet strike? And sir, do those bullet strikes appear to have entered from different, uh, or at different angles, slightly different angles? Well, from, from this viewpoint and looking at the damage, mm -hmm. uh, it appears they could have came in at an angle. Okay. Now, can you tell that just from a, a photograph? Uh, sometimes you can, uh, sometimes you can't. Did you use dowels at a later point to help determine the angles of those bullets? Uh, yes, I did. And how would that help you? If you, if you only have an entry, do you try to put the dowel in as far as it'll go? Well, I got to look for a second point of impact, and then when I put a, a dowel rod or a trajectory rod in, uh, that'll give me the angle, the way the projectile entered into it. Did you try to put dowels in at the gate gas station? No, I did not. Right. Did you preserve that for later at the JSO warehouse? Yes, I did. Okay. And the window damage, was the window in that position or did you move it at all prior to this photograph? Uh, this is the way I located it when I arrived on scene. States 36, uh, how many bullet strikes were to Jordan Davis's door? There were three. Okay, and can you circle the first of those three? And the second? And the third? And had you yourself been the one to close these doors at this point to document this? Yes, it was me. And did you close those doors after you had fully photographed the interior of the car? Yes, I did. In fact, are these photos representative of the sequential photographs that you took that night at the scene? Yes, they are. Okay. States Exhibit 37. Can you show the jurors any bullet strike on that photograph, please? Uh, yes, I can. There's actually, on, on this photograph, I can see two bullet strikes. Oh, can you circle? You? There's one bullet strike yes, sir. at the bottom taillight. Yes, sir. And then there's going to be another bullet strike going through the rear window. Yes, sir. And for the record purposes, are we still on the passenger side of this vehicle? Uh, yes, we are. Is it fair to call this the rear quarter panel? Yes. States Exhibit 38, is that a close-up of that top bullet strike to the rear quarter panel window? Yes, it is. Okay. And can you just circle that again for the jurors? States Exhibit 39, show the jurors the bullet strikes on this photograph and describe that portion of the vehicle. From, from this viewpoint of the rear of the vehicle, uh, I can see two bullet strikes. One of them is going to be into the hatchback, which is right here. And then the other one, which was on the previous photo, is near the tail lens, which was right here. And is the second one you circled depicted in the previous photographs? Yes, it was. Okay. And is that the end of the bullet strikes that you found on this red Dodge Durango? Yes. For a total of how many bullets? There were nine. Now, at that point, could you be concerned with what happened to the other four shell casings? Yes. 
Okay, and, and did you note, make a note that you had collected five and there were four more that needed to be accounted for? Correct. Yes, sir. All right, let me go on to State's Exhibit 40 and ask you if that's a close-up and then can you again circle those same two bullet stripes? This is the one on the hatchback and this is the one near the tail ends. Yes, sir. And by hatchback, is that the rear door that opens um, up as opposed to out? Correct. It opens upwards. State's Exhibit 41, sir. Let me ask you, are those two items um, pertinent to this case? Um, yes and no. Okay. Well, why did you photograph those two items? Uh, these were the items that I was informed where uh, there was a lady who was attempting to purchase them inside the store. Okay. And um, did you also put those items over into the property room? Yes, I did. And they're still there to this day? Yes. Okay. Let me then, sir, ask you, did you finish at the crime scene? Yes, at, I did. Approximately then. Was there a need for you to fingerprint that vehicle? No, there was not. And why is that? Uh, what well, was relayed on to me that there was nobody who may have touched that vehicle that I needed to recover fingerprints from. Had you gotten word from the homicide detectives that the shooter had actually touched the car, would you then have fingerprinted that vehicle? Yes, I would have. All right. Now, let me take you on, the, sir, to more photographs and explain to the jurors how that car was transported from the gate gas station. Uh, our agency uses a, a top-of-the-list wrecker system, and a wrecker came, a flatbed wrecker picked it up and towed it to the crime scene warehouse. And sir, when multiple gunshots from that velocity and that type of gun are fired into a vehicle, is it possible for fragments to slightly move in transit? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, did you eventually accompany that car to the warehouse? Yes, I did. And can you tell the jurors, is that warehouse secured? Yes, it is. And who has the keys to that warehouse? Uh, the crime scene unit maintains keys for it. Does even the homicide uh, unit have access to it without being accompanied by someone in your unit? No, they do not. And do you make sure that you're there when the wrecker driver delivers the car into the warehouse? Yes, I am. And then how does the car get transported after it's loaded off of the wrecker to its ultimate um, storage place inside the warehouse? The wrecker unloads the vehicle. He can back it into the warehouse, and then he unloads the vehicle into the warehouse, and then we have ways of moving around while it's inside the warehouse. How do you move it around? Uh, well, what we use as the crime scene detectives is we got these little go jacks. They're little dollies that go on the tire, and once we put them on the tire, we can jack it up, and I can push the vehicle around as it's on these dollies. And again, at this point, you have no concern about touching the outside of that car because fingerprints were not an issue in this case. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Then State's Exhibit 42, is that taken at the warehouse? Yes, it is. And does that again show the back of the Durango? Yes. State's 43? Uh, it's a photograph of the passenger side of the vehicle in the warehouse. Right. And is that lighting at the warehouse uh, significantly better than the lighting at the gate gas station? Yes, it is. And are those pink things in there the Goat Jacks? Yes, they are. Okay. State's Exhibit 44 in evidence. Uh, this is a photograph showing the passenger side doors that are open. Tell the jurors why you re-photographed at the warehouse some of the same things you had already photographed at the scene. Uh, I'm going to take overalls of the entire vehicle again, and this photograph is just going to depict what I'm viewing, how it got transported down there, and if anything has moved or shifted during transport. Okay. And then, sir, um, a photo that Officer Whittlesey actually took? Yes, it does. And did you familiarize yourself with it later and know it to be a portion of a fragment that was found a couple of days later? Yes. Now tell the jurors, I don't think I mentioned this, what time did you take your photos at the warehouse? Uh, I started taking pictures about 12.30 that night. Mm -hmm. So you, you worked through the night, is that correct? Yes, I did. Okay. State's Exhibit 48, what is that a close-up of? Uh, this is a close-up of the driver's side door. Okay, and again, did you check again to see if there were any weapons in there? Yes. Okay, were there 
No, there were not. Thank you. State's Exhibit 49. Uh, this is a photograph of the dashboard. And sort of a middle console area? Right. It also shows the console with the cups and a, a cell phone. Okay. And that, um, the green and just some papers, I think, in there? Correct. Okay. State's Exhibit 50. Can you tell the jurors about that photo? Uh, this is a photograph of the passenger, front passenger door that's open. Okay. To your knowledge, had the window moved any in transit? Or was it still the broken part of the window? Had it dropped any more, or was it still? Uh, this photograph shows it, how it broke. It folded over a little bit more, and it, it did drop down a little bit more during transport. All right, sir. State's Exhibit 51. Sir, tell the jurors, was this the first time you had opened the hatchback and taken a full photo of the storage area of the Durango? Yes, it was. Okay. Did you look closely and with great care throughout the entire back storage area of this red Dodge Durango? Well, while processing it, I'm looking for any type of evidence I could find. This is my first photograph showing it, but I searched everywhere in the back of that vehicle that there may be any type of possible evidence. Okay. Would that include firearms? Yes. Would it include a shotgun? Yes. From your experience as a police officer and an evidence technician, how big is a shotgun? Even if it's sawed off, how big, how big does it start sawed off? Uh, the smallest shotgun that I've run across has been 18 inches. Okay. And then a shotgun can be as long as three feet. Okay. Any handguns found in this area? No, there were not. Metal pipes? No. Any other kind of weapon at all, sir? I did not see any type of weapons. Let me take you then to State's Exhibit 52 and ask you to tell the jurors what that piece of paper, or is that, that's actually tape, isn't it? It sticks to the car? Yeah, what we call these, we call these sticker scales. Mm -hmm. And what I did with these things is I placed them next to items of evidence. Uh, on this particular thing, I'm placing them next to the bullet strikes. Okay. Have you, in your experience, photographed and documented bullet strikes from a number or a variety of types of ammunition? Yes, I have. Small caliber? Yes. Medium caliber? Yes. Large caliber? And yes. How would you categorize this type of a bullet strike right. as far as the caliber of the bullet that caused it? This would be in between a medium to large caliber. Okay. And is it consistent with a 9 millimeter being fired into this car? Yes, it is. Okay. And so you wrote a number on this measure, did you not? Yes, I did. And what number did you number this? Number one. And tell the jurors again why you started with this one as number one. Well, how I was going to document all the bullet strikes would just begin in chronological order. And I started at the rear of the vehicle. And then each bullet strike moving upward, forward to the vehicle got the next number. All right, sir. So is it fair to say to this jury that every single bullet strike started at this corner, or didn't start, we don't know where they started yet, but was contained from this corner to the front door all on the passenger side. Is that fair to say? Yes. And then State's Exhibit 53, is that a close-up of that bullet strike? Yes, it is. Okay. And on that measure, how wide does that bullet strike appear to be? And, and explain the measuring uh, device is it in centimeters, millimeters, inches? Uh, this sticker scale has two different types of measurements. The bottom one is in inches, and the top is metric. Okay. States Exhibit Fifty Four. Before I go there, did you then open the door to document any exit from this particular bullet strike? Yes, I did. Can bullets enter, exit, and re-enter? either a human body or an inanimate object? Yes. Okay, and do you find that in your experience to be true? Yes, I do. Okay, let me show you State's Exhibit 54, which is a little bit of a strange angle, so I want you to show the jurors what you did and how you took this photograph and what the inset of this composite photograph is. Uh, this is a photograph of the hatchback lid that I opened, and this is the backside of bullet strike number one. And the way I took this photograph is, is the hatchback is already lifted up, and I was underneath it taking a photo up. And in the background, you can see that's the, the roof of within our warehouse. 
So is it fair to call this the exit of the gunshot that you called number one? Yes, it is. Was there a re-entry point for that bullet? Yes, there was. Okay, let me show you State's Exhibit 55, sir, and ask you to circle the re-entry for that particular bullet. It's going to be right here th through the weather stripping. Were you able or did you try to recover a projectile or any fragments from within that car? Yes, I did. Okay. Let me take you then, sir, to State's Exhibit 56. Is that a close-up and what have you removed in this photograph of the re-entry point? What I did is I removed the weather stripping and by me removing the weather stripping, you can see where the continuation of the projectile went through the, the metal on the vehicle. So, sir, did that one bullet go through outside metal of the tailgate at the bottom, through the inside of that tailgate, back into metal, and cause that size hole? Yes, it did. States 57. Same process to explain the measure, the number you assigned it, and the entry point. Yes, I placed a sticker scale on this bullet strike, and I numbered it number two, and it's on the rear tail ends. Okay. And as far as a height differential between gun st gunshot strike number one and gunshot strike number two, were they in the same vis vicinity as far as height? Yes, they were. Okay. Um, was there a slight difference? Yes. Okay. And that can be seen in the photos you've previously shown the jury? Yes. Okay. And that measuring tool is the same type in inches and metric. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now, did you try to probe that to recover anything? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you recover something from there? No, I did not. Okay. States Exhibit 58. Can you circle the strike itself, the entry? All right, sir. And did part of the tail glass shatter, tail light shatter? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, was this just an entry without an exit and a re-entry? I, I couldn't find where the, it went through the way that the rear quarter panel is. Okay. I couldn't locate it. So the rear quarter panel, to your knowledge, could be hollow or have multiple compartments. Is that correct? Yes. And would you have had to completely disassemble the car yes. to try to find that? Thank you. States Exhibit 59. Uh, this is focusing on the rear window in the broken glass. Okay. And again, we'll refer to it as the rear quarter panel. Circle the actual, I know there's broken glass, but was there a way for you and your experience to tell where the bullet actually entered? Well, at, at the scene, the, the hole where the bullet went through was much smaller. So during transport, part of the, the glass fell apart more. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can tell where the bullet strike was because there's going to be a circular hole where the projectile entered through the glass. Okay. And, sir, did you find a place where that bullet path ended? Yes, I did. Okay. Let's go on then to the uh, close-up of that. And can you show the jurors that little hole you were describing to try to locate the exact point of entry? Uh, this is, of course, a, a close-up photograph of the broken glass. And where the hole, where the bullet went through would have been right here in this area where you can start seeing where the glass started to spider, where it started to break apart. All right, sir. And in order to try to track the entry and the ending point of this bullet, did you use a dowel? Yes, I did. All right, let me show you State's Exhibit 61 in evidence and tell the jurors about the dowel system and how you used it and the vantage point of this photograph. Well, well these particular dowel rods, you can connect together to make them as long as you need. And what I did is I placed a dowel rod knowing where the entry point was in the broken glass, and I continued it forward to where the second impact of the projectile struck. In your experience as both a law enforcement officer who has fired weapons and an evidence technician who has had training in ballistics, do bullets tend to travel in a straight path until they hit something? Yes, they do. Okay. And from what angle are you taking this photograph? I'm basically in the front seat of it with my camera and trying to get a photograph showing the angle of it coming through the back window. All right, sir. So the point of entry is at the back of this photograph or sort of the middle of this photograph? 
Well, the, the, the point of entry is going to be that rear quarter panel window. Okay, and circle that in this photo. It's going to be back over in this area. And even with excellent digital photography, were you able to get the whole thing in this photo? No, I was not. All right, let's take you to States Exhibit 62 then and explain, is this the continuation of that same dowel? Yes, it is. And from what angle are you taking this photograph? I'm just outside of the driver's door. Okay. And where does that dowel end? Well, there's damage to the top of the visor where the projectile hit. Yes, sir. And the projectile kept on going and hit the glass. And then what happened to the projectile itself? Did you find that projectile? Well, I found fragments of the projectile. All right, sir. Then let me ask you um, to look at States Exhibit 63. Is that the damage that that number three bullet strike did to this vehicle? Yes, it is. And is that the visor right next to the driver's head? Yes, it is. States Exhibit 64, can you orient the jurors to this photograph, please? This is part of the dashboard that's from the vantage point of where the driver would be sitting. Okay. And States Exhibit 65. Uh, this is a, a close-up photograph, and I'm trying to focus on two pieces of fragment that are on the dashboard. Can you circle those two pieces of fragment? This is one. This was two. Okay. And so you continue to just... Con Let me strike that and start over. Did you document photographically from further shots down to close-up shots to try to track this bullet from the back rear quarter panel up to the front driver's windshield area? Yes, I did. And this is on the inside of the windshield? Yes, it is. So that bullet stayed inside that car? Yes, it did. States Exhibit 66, from what angle is this photograph? This is outside of the vehicle, and I'm taking a photograph trying to take a photograph of where the fragments landed through the front windshield. Okay, but they were, they were inside the front windshield, is that correct? Yes, they were. But can you circle them as you viewed them from the outside? I can clearly see this one right here, and then the other one's going to be further up where you can't see it, where the glass has got, like it's, it's got black tint. All right, so did you put those projectiles, State 67, is that a close-up of one of them? Uh, yeah, this is a, a, a close-up photograph of one of the fragments. And are you looking through the outside of the windshield? Yes, I am. Is that pretty much as far in the corner of the windshield as you can get? Yes, it is. Is it fair to say that that bullet traversed the car at a complete angle from the back rear quarter panel to the front windshield? Yes, it did. Okay. And then State 68, sir, are those the two fragments you recovered from the dashboard? Yes, they are. And did you package those for evidence? Yes, I did. All right, let me show you. Are those the two fragments that you recovered that are shown in States 68? Uh, yes, they are. Okay, and did you preserve those for any possible future testing by FDLA? Yes, I did. Okay, may I publish, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. cover these items as soon as you're through with the close-up photographs? Yes, I do. And do you place them, go ahead and place them in envelopes and mark them as you go along? Yes, I do. So as you recovered any projectiles from inside that car, you would immediately put them into these envelopes and then move on? Correct. Okay, let me take you then to some more photographs and some more evidence. And let's look at State's uh, Exhibit 60. 69. And again, is that a close-up now with measures 
of the three bullet strikes to the rear passenger door, the seat where Jordan Davis was sitting. Right. This is just a medium range photograph of the passenger doors. Okay. And those measures you placed underneath each one, is that correct? Yes, I did. And again, do those appear to be different sizes? Yes, they do. And explain to the jury how three bullets fired from the same gun could appear to be different sizes. On this particular one, you can see there's three different sizes. Uh, when a bullet strikes the, the projectile itself, there's basically two different parts of it. You got a copper jacket part of it, and then inside of the copper jacket, there's a lead. Uh, when a bullet strikes, sometimes the copper jacket will mushroom uh, when it hits an object. Sometimes it goes straight through. Sometimes if it hits it and it mushrooms, it's going to leave a bigger hole going through uh, a tin metal object like this. All right, sir. And it shows one of the strikes to the front passenger side. Is that correct? Yes, it does. Okay. State 70 in evidence. Tell the jurors about that photograph. Uh, this photograph detects bullet strikes number four, five, and six, or that I labeled as four, five, and six, and it, and it shows the different size holes, which we were talking about. All right. And the same type of measures, is that correct? For any measure that the jury's going to see with regard to the bullets, it's the same in inches at the bottom, metric at the top, is that correct? Yes. Thank you, sir. States 71 in evidence. Uh, this is a close-up photograph of uh, strike number four. State 72. It's a close-up photograph of bullet strike number five. And states number 73. Uh, close-up photograph of bullet strike number six. Now, sir, is there less paint missing from around this bullet strike than there was from the previous two? Yes. Did you yourself scrape away any of the paint? No, I did not. Did you photograph it as you saw it? Yes, I did. Do you have an explanation as to what could account for there being less paint missing from the surrounding of this entry than the previous ones? Well, this particular entry, it shows it's a, a more of a complete circle. Uh, there's less damage to the tin, the metal itself. And when the metal on the other photographs will show, when it bends more, the like paint... Like 72, I'm showing you 72. Correct. The paint is going to uh, not bend with the metal as well, and it's just going to flake off. All right, sir. And then state 74 in evidence. Uh, this is mostly showing the front passenger side with the sticker scales numbering the bullet strikes. All right. Did you take close-ups of each of those as well? Yes, I did. State 75 in evidence. Uh, this shows bullet strike number seven. State 76. Uh, a close-up of bullet strike number eight. And again, would that be the same explanation for whether or not there is a particular amount of paint surrounding the circumference of the bullet entry? Correct. States number 77. Uh, it's bullet strike number 9. Okay. And states number 78. It's a close-up of bullet strike number 9. Okay. Let me take you then to states number 79. How did that door get into that condition? Uh, what I did here is this is the front passenger door, and I took the, the plastic covering, the armrest part of it, of the door off of it. And tell the jurors why you did that. Uh, I was trying to see where the strikes went through. I already knew they went through the exterior metal, and I wanted to see where it went through in the interior metal. And you knew that they had gone through because there was no sign of a projectile sitting in those holes from the outside. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So... In, you had carefully documented this prior to removing this portion of the car. Yes. But for the juror's reference, there are lots of photographs showing what it looked like before. Is that correct? That can yes. be compared. Okay. So once you removed it, did you find the landing place of those three bullets? Yes, I did. Did any of those three bullets penetrate that door and go into the interior where one young man was sitting in the front passenger seat. No, they did not. Okay. Where did you find evidence of the landing place, the resting place of those projectiles? Uh, there'll be photographs that are going to document that there's going to be dents on this side of the door where the projectile struck. Okay. And again, sir, is this a portion of the car that has lots of little metal places and compartments inside? Yes. Did you ever try to completely dismantle that door to collect fragments, projectiles, or anything else? Uh, 
No, I did not. Were you able, however, to find some when you continued your search for those three bullet strikes? Yes, I did. Okay, let's go on then to states number 80. Explain what this is to the jurors. All right. This is a sticker scale, and on it I documented it as 7A, and I, I noted it as A because on the other side of the door is going to be bullet strike number 7. So this is going to be the continuation of the projectile when it went through the strike number 7 and okay. hit okay. the inside of the metal. And did it actually dimple the metal? Yeah, you can. Can I circle it? Please. You can tell right here where the paint has been flaked off, there's going to be a dimple from where the projectile struck that part of the metal. All right, sir. And states exhibit, and, and what is the black thing below that, the black area of that car? What is that? Right here? Yes, sir. Um, uh, that's going to be a little rubber grommet uh, that's just in the door. Okay. States exhibit 81. 81 is going to show the inside of the door, and it's got two of the sticker scales showing 8A and also 9A. And by 8A and 9A, explain again those references to the jury. 8A is going to be the continuation from bullet strike number 8 that went through the door and then struck the inside part of the metal door. Okay. And also with... Uh... Strike number 9A is going to be the continuation of bullet strike number 9 that struck and left a, a dent in the interior part of the metal. All right, and you took close-ups of those as well? Yes, I did. States number 82, is that the close-up of 8A? Yes, it is. Can you circle the dimpling that was caused by that bullet? It's, it's going to be where the paint, partial of the paint, has been removed and it's shiny metal now. And actually, I said dimple. A dimple implies that it goes in. This is the outside portion of where it dimpled it. Yeah, this correct? is more of a, a dent. Dent. Thank you. States Exhibit 83. What I did here is I placed an arrow to note to where the dent was because I wasn't sure because this is a flat two-dimensional photograph. So right here you can see where the dent is in the metal where the continuation of bullet strike number nine went to. All right, sir. And to clarify for the jury, is there a projectile still sitting inside that dent? No, there is not. Okay. So that's the way the metal ended up, but you were not able to recover this projectile? No. Okay. States Exhibit 84, if you can explain that part of the photograph to the jury, or that part of the door in that photograph. Uh, why I took this photograph is I'm, I'm focusing on this hollow area of the door to where you can have access within the, the hollow point of the, the door itself. Okay. And did you look down in that hollow area? Yes, I did. And without dismantling the door in its entirety, are you able to tell which portions of where those, other, those three bullets struck could have dropped projectile material down into there? Are you able to tell that? Well, I searched inside of it, and I did locate three different pieces of a projectile. Okay. And states 85, explain that one to the jury. I'm, I'm trying to photograph what I could see with my eyes because I could stick my head inside that little hole right there and look and I could see something, but my camera was just too big to get in there. So this is a photograph showing how I'm trying to take pictures of where the uh, fragments were located. And you said you found three. Yes, I did. Okay. Now, could three full bullets going through both the outside metal of that car and the inside metal have shredded to the point where there were only fragments left? Yes. Okay. States 86 in evidence, sir. Are those the three fragments you recovered? Yes, they are. All right. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Silva? <coughs> States exhibit 189 in evidence. States 86 is the photograph. Yes, they are. And does the packaging bear your markings as you recover them at the JSO warehouse? Yes, they do. And did you preserve these for future processing by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, I did. May I publish to the jury, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am.
the detective that will summarize these exhibits. Because we've done them piecemeal. And if I may allow them, may I stay right here for just a moment? Yes, ma'am. State's Exhibit 185 and evidence. Can you again explain these five shell casings and where they were found? These are the five 9 millimeter shell casings that I recovered from the parking lot at the gate gas station. Okay, that was in, in the parking space itself? Yes. By the yellow uh, pole? Correct. Okay. And then you found one projectile there, sir, and would that be this first one, say 186? Yes. Can you see from up there? Yes, I can. Okay, and then the fragment that's in is state 187? Yes. And it has the number 7? Correct. Yes, they could. And then states 188 in evidence. And I'm sorry, I have a lot of money. I apologize to the jurors. State 188? Yes. And are those the two fragments you recovered from the front left windshield area? Yes, they are. By the driver's door? Correct. And then the last exhibit we just put in states 189? Correct. Are those the three fragments you recovered from the front right passenger door down in that little pocket? Yes, they are. From the inside of the vehicle? Yes. Covering all of this physical evidence? By placing dowels through the bullet strikes, it's able to make a determination on the trajectory. All right. Then let's go on to the photographs that have the dowels. And let me ask you to start, sir, with stage 87. Can you explain that photograph to these jurors? What I've done here is I used trajectory dowel rods to place through the bullet strikes. And then I took a photograph of it from the front angle going back to the rear of the vehicle of the dowel rods going through the bullet strikes. How many dowels did you use? I used nine. Does each dowel comport with a gunshot fired into that vehicle? Yes, it does. Did you choose the angles? Excuse me? Did you choose these angles? No, ma'am, I did not. Tell the jurors how the angles are determined. How I make a determination on the angle is, is from you've seen on the bullet strikes, and the closest one you see is going to be bullet strike number nine. I can place the dowel rod through that hole, and I have to line it up. That's the primary hole where it was first shot. Then the secondary hole, all I have to do is place the dowel rod on to that, and if it holds firm, and then that will show you the angle or the trajectory, how the projectile went through the air and traveled into the vehicle. All right, sir, then since, let's start with just 7, 8, and 9, which are to the front right passenger door. Since those bullets did not exit the interior of the vehicle and fell somewhere in between the door frame, how did you determine where to land that dowel, where to, where to stop the dowel? On the inside of the metal, we could see where those dents were. And if it wouldn't have been a dent, it would have continued all the way through. So that's where I placed the rods all the way through to touch where that dent would be. Did you have any problem at all finding the resting spot for those dowels? No, I did not. And then for the ones that did re-enter or go through the car, did you have any trouble at all placing those through to approximate the angle at which those bullets entered that vehicle? No, I did not. All right. Let's go then to States 88 in evidence. And is that yet another view of those dowels? Correct. This view is trying to show basically a shot of the three dowels at the angle from which they were fired from. Okay, and you can only approximate that having been told about the testimony from those who were actually there when the shooting occurred. Is that correct? Yes. You did not try to exactly recreate this, did you, sir? No, I did not. And could you have exactly recreated it without having everyone there remembering everything in minute detail? That is true. Okay. So let's go on then to States 89. Explain that vantage point to the jurors. Um, these are the dowel rods that are going through what I would consider the rear quarter panel of the vehicle. Okay. And you are standing as though you were at the back of the vehicle looking towards it. Is that correct? You're, I'm, I'm sorry, the side looking towards the back quarter panel. Is right, that this is a photograph of the, me facing the quarter panel taking a photograph. All right, 
States 90. Uh, this is a photograph showing where bullet strike number three went through the glass, and I'm trying to show the direct straight path of where the trajectory rod. All right, sir, and again, yeah. that traversed the car completely through the middle of it at that height. Is that correct? Yes, it did. Is it fair to say that that's head height for anyone above five foot five? Yes, it is. States number 91, explain that angle to the jury. You're, are you on the ground when you took that photo? No, with, with this particular photo, I was using a ladder and I was trying to get an aerial vantage point to show a, a higher angle going down. States number 92, sir, can you explain that? Uh, I took a photograph l as low as I could get going upwards to show a different vantage point. States number 93. And once I was on a ladder on this one here too, uh, taking a photograph going at a, a downward uh, angle. Detective Kippel, once you placed these dowels in, did you move them again? prior to taking all these photographs? Uh, eventually, when I completed my investigation, I did remove them. Right, but not, you didn't maneuver them to take certain shots, did you? Oh, no, I did not. So they stayed, the dowels stayed in the same position in which you inserted them, and then you took photos from different angles. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. States 94 in evidence, sir. What this photograph shows is the rear passenger door and the dowel rods are going completely through the door, but I, ha I took photographs with the door open. Okay. And does that in any way mean that the door was open when those shots were fired into the car? No, it does not. In fact, did you find evidence to support the fact that the door was closed when those three shots were fired into the car? Yes, I did. What did you look for and what did you find? Well. You want me to go on with the photographs? If there's a photograph, it would there explain is. it. States Exhibit 95. Uh, this is a photograph of the, the bench seat in the back, and it's showing the three dowel rods going through the door. And again, sir, once you inserted those three dowel rods into that back door, did you ever manipulate them in any way to take this photograph? No, I did not. Can you explain to the jurors why there are re-entries on the inside and there were not in the front door. In other words, why did the, the shots into the front door drop inside the door? Why did these penetrate? Is there a difference in those doors? Well, I did not take the plastic panel off of this one. And tell them why you did not do that. Well, I didn't want to destroy any of the evidence or how the, the bullet holes caused damage on the inside of the plastic. But on the front door, it didn't go through. And the front door definitely shows it has more metal on the door than probably what the rear door has. Right, sir. So outside, circle the three areas where the bullets came through around the dowels. And outside of the bullet holes themselves coming through, what other damage was there to those doors? On the inside where you see the plastic? Mm -hmm. It came through and it broke the, the plastic pieces off while coming through the, the door. All right, let me show you states 96 into evidence, sir. Do you see any of those plastic pieces of the door inside that vehicle? Uh, there's debris that's on, on the seat, but can, it, it, it's small. Can you circle it? You got something right there and then some little things right there. I think and this is going to be a piece of broken glass. Okay. States exhibit 97 in evidence. From what vantage point did you take that photograph? I'm basically got the camera at the backrest of the back seat uh, taking a photograph going forward towards the door. Right, sir. Can you explain to the jury what a DNA swab is? Okay. Well, part of my job is to collect DNA, and what a swab is is we use a sterile cotton swab, and whatever item needs to be collected, uh, depending on what we're going to do, is we uh, dampen the cotton swab with distilled water, and whatever item I need to collect, all we have to do is just rub the swab on the item, 
Then we package it and seal it. Now, sir, do you swab ballistic items just in case and preserve that evidence in case you don't ever determine who the shooter is? Yes, we do. Okay, so do you do that in every single case no matter what? Yes, we do. And was a DNA swab taken of those five shell casings that you've previously shown to the jury that night? Yes, they were. All right, let me show you what's marked into evidence as states 197. Yes, ma'am. So explain what a tuck swab is to the jury then. And you can just hold it up to display it if you wish. Uh, a touch swab is what I explained, is we just take a sterile cotton swab and what we think somebody may have touched is where I would rub the swab over uh, in an attempt to try to recover any type of DNA that would be on that item. And Detective Kipple, I want to take you back to a photograph of the vehicle and states 96. Can you look again at that small black uh, item that you had originally circled? Now, did the glass on the back passenger door break? Yes, it did. Okay. And the piece that's on the seat, is that plastic or glass? Uh, I thought it was a piece of glass from looking at this type of photograph, but it, it, it could be plastic. I, I can't really tell. You can't tell from the photograph, but can I take you back then to States 95? <coughs> Is the piece on the seat consistent with the large portion of black plastic blown out by your bottom left dowel? Right. By, by looking at this piece right here and the, the angle and the size and all that, I can. it's like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> it looks like it would fit right into that. Is it down inside the door at this point? Uh, I didn't see no. much broken glass, so I'm assuming when it, it broke, uh, it, it slid down into the, the chamber itself. Did you ever try to pull it back out? No, I did not. Okay. We have just a moment with co-counsel, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. I'm here with Detective Kipple. Thank you, sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think what we'll do is take a morning break. Uh, we've been going almost an hour and a half, thereabouts. So... Um, Let's break until uh, 5 minutes of 11. Don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't let anybody discuss the case uh, in your presence. We'll see you back in about 15, 18 minutes, something like that.